Hi everybody, welcome back. This week we're going to spend some time getting into more of the institutional, sorry, aspects of the correctional system and we're going to begin so by taking a look at jails. Um, so for jails, for those of you who are um, familiar with maybe the term jail or the term prison, um, they're not interchangeable terms. They are two in uh, distinct facilities and jails are most commonly used for short-term short misdemeanor offenders, um, meaning somebody who has been convicted of a misdemeanor and who has been sentenced to an incarceration sentence of less than one year. On the other hand, jail or prisons rather are more long-term facilities, and we'll talk about that more next week when we get into the idea of prisons. Um, so we're talking about people who are there for temporary amounts of time, not the long-termers, um, just people who are there for maybe a few months or any time up to a year itself. So um, like I said before, prisons we spend more time on because there's just a lot more um, people who are incarcerated in prison. So I feel like we want to spend more of our time and attention focusing on the majority rather than the minority. Um, but it's important to take a look at the short-term facilities as well because they do... They do house the short-termers, but they do a little bit more than that. Um, so we'll get into all of the good stuff that jails uh, do in just a second here. So in focusing on the purpose of jails, like we talked about, they incarcerate the misdemeanor offenders. Um, but there's there there are more people in a jail facility than just those who have already been sentenced so we see jails routinely house the freshly arrested so you've been booked you're waiting your first appearance um, those who have been denied bond or who cannot afford their bond release are going to spend their pretrial supervision period while in a jail. Um, those who might be awaiting transfer to their final prison, if a prison is overcrowded or there's no space for a potential inmate, that inmate might will begin serving their car incarceration sentence while in a jail. And then those days, weeks, months, whatever it is, will apply to their final sentence as well. But... In talking about jail, what you really see is just this mixture of everything. It's a short-term temporary space, and with that short-term temporary status, jails can often be worse experiences than actual prisons. So we have this mixture of all sorts of different people. If we're talking about folks who have been freshly arrested, they've just been pulled in off the streets, Perhaps they're still under the influence of a substance like a narcotic or like alcohol. If they have a physical dependence to that drug and they're taken away from that substance very quickly, withdrawal is going to begin. Um, so in jails, you often see a lot of sick individuals who are trying to dry out while in that prison, or I'm sorry, within that facility, not a prison, a jail. I even I got myself confused there for a second, um, but they're trying to dry out. So vomiting, fever, all of this stuff will be happening. And most oftentimes, those people are not going to be in a secure hospital or clinic type space. They'll be drying out in a in a jail cell themselves. Um, so they're withdrawing from substance abuse. You might have indi individuals who have um, mental health issues that are in the general population before they can be screened out and taken somewhere else. Um, you have people that are physically sick, just coughs, colds, all kinds of stuff that they're carrying in from the outside. That's now around you. And of course, you have those people who are just plain angry at the world for being arrested. And here you are sitting in the middle of all of it. So not necessarily the place you want to find yourself, but here we are. Okay, so not a fun place to be no matter how long you are there for. A lot less stability in jails compared to prisons. When we're talking about an individual who goes to prison, um, normally they're there for a significant amount of time, as we've already talked about in our sentencing lecture. Um, maybe I'm housed with one other person. I have one, maybe two cellmates three temporarily if I'm in a very bad, very overcrowded prison, but generally not much more than three or four total people inside one cell. And if there's three or four people inside one cell, it's a slightly larger cell, but it's a little bit less common of an experience than just me 
and one cellmate. But it does happen. So I'm there with people that I will be spending the long haul with. I might not always get along with that cellmate, but for the most part, you start to grow a relationship with them. You're there more permanently. You have time to, this is probably not the most popular thing to say or the, or the most um, correct thing to say, but you have time to make yourself comfortable in a prison compared to a jail. And I say that because not everybody likes the idea of prison being a comfortable space. But if you think about it, if you're there for years at a time, you have time to, like you would anywhere, set up sh shop and sort of try to make it your own. You write letters back and forth to your family. Now you have letters. Maybe they send you pictures. You have a newspaper subscription. You have uh, money at the commissary. Maybe you're able to purchase a book or somebody sends you a book in the mail. Um, if you have enough money in your commissary, maybe you have enough, uh, maybe you're in a prison that allows small televisions, uh, maybe you're in a prison that allows you to have a Walkman headset. Um, so there's, there's time to sort of make the more basic, harder conditions of your prison um, experience just a tiny bit more comfortable if you can. But in jail, there's there's no time, there's no space, there's no ability to, to bring in any comfort um, when you're in a cell with three to four others or if you're in a general um, population holding cell, you're there with all of these other sick, vomiting, angry, withdrawing people, um, everybody who's waiting for their first appearance or everybody who's waiting for their transfer. It's a very different experience overall. Um, jail, remember, is just all about these temporary conditions, so there's less desire to make things better, I guess. Um, but in addition to the physical realities of the facility itself, we know a bit about its inhabitants beyond the fact that they might be trying to dry out or they're angry or they're waiting for this or they're waiting for that. Um, there's a few things we know in general about jail inmates to be true. Research suggests that at a very young age, they're showing indicators that they might be problematic down the line. Um, they have, they don't play well with others. They exhibit anger or maybe violent tendencies at an early age. They might show signs of addiction issues down the line. Um, they're engaging in a lot of a variety of different criminal behaviors. So these not, not ne these are not necessarily our specialists, but they're just maybe doing small petty types of things um, to be able to score their next drug, uh, you know, the next hit of whatever they're using, or they're just doing small petty things to get a little bit of cash to make it through, um, supplementing their income, so to speak. So it's not necessarily really severe, serious crimes. They're just small little petty things that might be ending, that might be adding up. But they certainly um, are being arrested and convicted and have these prior records when they come back to, to jail. So not specialists by any means. In prisons, you tend to see a little bit more specialty situations happening in which offenders are committing the same type of offense over and over again if they are recidivating. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. We see that um, individuals who are in, are, are in jail are often frequent flyers, so they're reoccurring figures. Um, sometimes it might be just for a few days at a time. They get put, picked up drunk off the streets. They're released. Um, it's not a big deal. They're not serving a significant amount of time. It's the petty types of criminals who are committing these lower level offenses. Um, Especially in the winter time, what you end up seeing is a lot of homeless individuals who are committing something small and insignificant to be able to get out of the elements. It's the idea of three hots and a cot. Um, I commit something small, low level, and I get off the streets for a while. Not, and I'm not saying that this, this applies to all homeless individuals, but this time of year is when you see more homeless people commit crimes than you do in the summertime. Um, but the idea of three hots in a cot is certainly prevalent among this community in which if I commit something small, I get off the street, I get out of the cold, I have a place to sleep, I have some not great food, but I have food, um, and I don't commit anything that is severe enough to put me away for a long time, but I'm in out of the cold for, for at least a little bit of time. Um, so 
especially in the wintertime, homeless, homeless individuals tend to be a little bit more, more revolving door than at other times of the year. But again, not anything that is life changing or, or significant or severe or violent, just very petty types of things that will get them in there. So you, you see a lot of people that are in prison for a variety, or I'm sorry, in jail for a variety of different reasons. Um, but one of the things that is mixed in with these low level types of offenders is that you do see some felony offenders in jails and they're awaiting their transfer to their final prisons. But um, as you remember from the last lecture, prisons are often over capacity due to sentencing enhancements and the use of mandatory minimums at the state and federal level. And this then sort of has a trickle down effect on the jails at the local level. So when you have a state or federal um, federal facility that is at or over capacity, one of the things that that facility will do is that they'll just blanket stop accepting inmates. We have no more cells open. We have no more beds. We are over overcrowded. We can't take any more people in. Stop sending them. So once a person has been sentenced and the prison is not going to accept them, they're just going to stay at the jail and begin serving their sentence there. Um, and they might there be there for a couple weeks, they might be there for a couple months. In some rare instances, we have heard stories that prisons are so overcrowded that felony inmates are serving their entire sentence in jails before they can be transferred. And I say, we hear about this anecdotally. It's not a widespread thing that is happening. And anecdotally, those who who are serving the entirety of their sentence are probably two-year termers or something small like that. Certainly still felony offenders, but we're not talking um, somebody who's sentenced to five, ten years and they're spending that entire time in jail. It's it's people who are serving these low-level felony type of, of conviction crimes or prison sentences rather um, but still it's it's a massive problem where the overcrowding at the prison level is now starting to affect the jails whereas the jails don't necessarily have as much of an overcrowding problem because you see so much turnover um, one of the the jails that has the worst overcrowding problem is out in Los Angeles where you have the county jails just being at max capacity and for a good long while um, Los Angeles has kind of corrected this problem a little bit but for a good long while Los Angeles had pe people um, inmates sleeping in like the cafeterias and the kitchens anywhere they could pretty much fit a rolling bed they would put an inmate to sleep there and that wasn't real great in terms of facilities or bathroom use or anything like that um, so Los Angeles has been court mandated to make changes but typically at the jail level, you don't necessarily see the same level of overcrowding. And that one of the reasons be is because of that turnover. Um, but as you see that turnover, you're seeing new faces, you're seeing repeat faces. And many of the short termers are revolving door inmates that keep coming back. And as soon as they're released, they do something else and they come back a couple months later. Um, so we're seeing current and past exposure to the criminal justice system with many of our jail inmates. So let's say you, you get released, you're on parole, or you're, you start your secondary sentence of probation, you do something on the outside that gets you revocated. Um, so not only are they coming back for brand new offenses, but we're seeing a lot of jail inmates that are coming back for technical violations because their community supervision has been revoked in some way, shape, or form. Um, so between the new offenses and the technical violations, what we're seeing is that the official data is further supporting the idea that we're just seeing a lot of circulation happening in jails at much higher rates than we are at prisons. Because remember, again, we're talking a temporary facility versus a long-term facility. So there's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of revolution. Um, and it's just the official statistics are sort of supporting what we've always known to be true about jails is that as soon as you go out, you're pretty much guaranteed to come back in. So um, nobody here is really a stranger to the system. And as we know, 
past behavior is often a positive predictor of future behavior. So if you do have something like criminal behavior in your past, you're likely to recidivate again unless you have time, money, resources, a support system, a job, a place to live, a desire to change. Um, unless you have these things present, your behavior is likely to continue down the same pathway unless there is a stimulus and a desire to be able to change that behavior once you are released from jail and are living back in the community. <coughs> in terms of social support, it sort of ties into this argument about social histories of jail inmates. And that for many of these individuals, they were not raised in the most stable of neighborhoods, the stable of home environments. Many jail inmates have um, a history or a report of being raised in a single family household. Um, if you were raised in a single family household, most likely, especially if you are a minority, that, that parent is most likely to be your mother um, who is working multiple jobs and perhaps she is not home to supervise you, therefore you get in touch with the wrong crowd, so on and so forth. Um, and it's just too much time on your hands leads to an increase in criminality. And it's not a commentary on anything, it's just to say that people from one parent households are more likely to be incarcerated than people from two-parent households, regardless of minority status. Um, the other thing that, that sort of attributes to you going or the likelihood of you being incarcerated is the idea that if one of your parents have been incarcerated, then you are more likely to become incarcerated yourself down the line. Um, we see a high rate of this with people who have fathers who are incarcerated, but we see a much higher rate of incarceration occur if your mother has been incarcerated because still in Amer American society today, most mothers are the primary caretaker of their children. And if a mother gets incarcerated, then that child might go to another family member or worst case, worst case scenario gets put in the foster system. So if you have exposure to the foster system, system you're being bounced around. That's more indication of instability. The higher levels of instability that you have in your life, the more likely you are to become incarcerated with yourself as you to become incarcerated yourself down the line. Excuse me. Um, so just generally more exposure to the system overall um, sort of predicates your own likelihood of becoming incarcerated. Um, let's see, what else do we know to be true about jails? Drug use, we've already sort of talked about the idea of drug and alcohol dependency. Floating around jails is a very common thing. Um, many people think that if, oh, you know, if you get arrested, it's not the worst thing in the world, at least you'll dry out. But the thing with substance abuse and addiction is that even if the physical dependence is removed from you, even if you go through withdrawal, even though your body might not be physically dependent on the drug anymore, your mind still is. And dependence on a substance, whether it's alcohol or an illegal substance, um, is really a two-fold two event. There's the physical dependence and then there's the mental dependence. And the mental dependence is often... Um, much stronger than the physical dependence and that is the thing that will cause you to go back and use again um, whether you're still incarcerated or not there's plenty of substances floating around prison and jails that allow inmates to be able to use while they still are incarcerated um, the big thing about the argument that jail will dry you out yes it will um, but it might also kill you so depending on what you are physically dependent on. Alcohol and heroin in particular have been known to cause um, death during withdrawal depending on the level of dependence that the person has to the physical substance. Um, heroin much more so than alcohol but those two in general have been known to cause many problems during withdrawal and like I said you often do not spend your withdrawal period within a facility, um, a hospital, a clinic, anything like that. And the level of contraband that just goes around these different facilities, even if you do start withdrawing, you don't have to go through permanent withdrawal. If you're really 
desperate enough, somebody can get you something. I mean, you'll have to wheel and deal and make all kinds of compromises for it. Um, but it's not difficult to get different levels of contraband within a secured facility at all. Um, <coughs> furthermore, as we're talking about things um, like substance abuse and dependence, that's certainly a health issue that needs to be addressed. But inmates also walk into jail coming off the streets with all the things that they regularly deal with in their normal lives. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you have any sort of medical condition, that doesn't just suddenly go away because you're in jail. Um, you know, if you have diabetes, you have diabetes on the street or while you're incarcerated. If you have asthma on the streets, you have asthma while you're incarcerated. So many people are still dealing with the same diseases and same conditions that they had on the outside, but now that they are in jail, the big problem becomes, how do I get medication, right? And um, there's a lot normally going on during the intake process, and for jail facilities, for the correctional officers, it's normally not the biggest priority to immediately get you what you need. Um, at intake, there will be a full screening and they will ask you what kind of medical conditions you have, but it might sometimes take a few days before everything can be straightened out and the paperwork goes through. If you get arrested on a Friday, things might not be processed until a Monday, and that's a couple days where you do not have the medications that you need. So if you are in jail... And let's say I, like, I'm a diabetic and I'm relying on insulin. There might be a little bit more of a push to get you what you need compared to if you are asthmatic. I'm asthmatic. I don't have an inhaler on me. Well, let's just hope you don't have an attack, right? And if you do have an attack, there's an emergency method of treatment that we can give you, but there's no inhaler that's going to magic, magically appear in your hands. Um, so all of the medical conditions that you come into jail with have to be treated but are not immediately treated the moment you walk in the door. The worst thing, I mean, medical conditions and diseases are ongoing, right? But so are mental health issues. So if you're on, if you're bipolar and you're taking some kind of medication for that, um, you know, it takes a while for you to get those medications back. So your bipolar is being exacerbated in the meanwhile. All sorts of medical or mental health issues that might not be treated on the outside, right? Because we know that mental health patients are not always the best at seeking treatment and help on the outside. Um, they're not getting treated right away on the inside either. And unfortunately, that's exacerbate, exacerbating the condition and making things worse. And jail is not a great condition or a great location for mental health conditions. Um, if anything, incarceration sort of makes mental health worse than it does at treating the conditions that we have um, for inmates that have severe mental health issues. All right, um, so as we're talking about the idea of health, um, one of the things that um, I want to talk about is the idea of dying in jail, dying in prison. So um, deaths do happen, whether um, it is from disease, whether or not something is happening to you, <coughs> whether it's through the withdrawal process, um, deaths do happen during incarceration. The, motor the mortality rate is still a lot higher in prisons than it is for jails. Again, due to this long-term um, status that we have in prisons, people are serving long sentences. They're likely to die of old age or they're likely to die of something while they are incarcerated in a prison. Um, but deaths do happen in a jail too. The number one way that individuals die while they are incarcerated in a jail is suicide. And normally that happens within the first few days of their stay. <coughs> the secondary way in which people die in jails is through some sort of illness that has been left untreated like we just got done talking about with the medications. Um, but if you're in a prison, it's much more likely that you're dying of old age or you're dying by violence than it is in jails given the short-term temporary nature, nature of the facility. One thing to keep in mind that in very large facilities, the mortality rate often goes up for jails. You have um, more inmates in a larger facility as the size of the facility increases, the chaos increases, 
Um, the number of inmates who need medication increases. Um, all sorts of different things are happening. So you can imagine that as the size of the facility increases, so does the mortality rate. There's just, there's just too much going on and resources are being spread thinner and thinner. There's not enough supervision. People kill themselves faster, you know, whatever it might end up being. So there's that catch sort of 22 with jails in terms of death, mortality, keeping people alive and supervised. And it's just, it's a hard situation to be in with a jail. It's just... I would say an overall level, a higher level of disorganization and chaos that's happening that is not happening in a prison. So if you're thinking about sort of the temporary nature of a jail, you have to sit there and ask yourself, if it was me, um, would I rather be in a fully disorganized, fully chaotic, um, less in a space that has less resources, less correctional officers, maybe there are inherently more dangers than a prison. Um, would I rather spend my time there and have a shorter sentence? Or would I rather be in a place that is more stable, more secure, um, more permanent? I have a little bit more comforts, but I have to stay there longer. Um, you know, as I sit there and I think about it, I often say, well, I think I'd rather endure the worse environment for a shorter amount of time than the better environment for a longer period of time. Um, I just don't want to be incarcerated in any way, shape, or form. I mean, I'm probably not likely to be incarcerated at any point in time in my life anyway, so it's, it's probably all a hypothetical, but I think I would rather put up with the chaos and get out faster then then spend more time incarcerated than I can. And I think many prob people probably feel the same way about it, um, especially as you move into prisons. There's more likelihood for time in solitary isolation. You have more things to deal with, like gang members and violence and all sorts of other things. So is it really a better situation or are you just facing a different set of dangers? Um, next week, we're going to start talking about those dangers. And next week, we're going to be talking about things like security levels and both the state and federal um, prison system. We're going to be talking about solitary isolation. So the idea that I stay in my prison cell by myself isolated for 22 to 24 hours a day, what that does to my mental health, how do I get there, what is it used for other than punishment, um, all sorts of different things. So next week we're going to take the jump and make our way into more long-term facilities such as prison. And we're then going to segue after next week into talking about more of the specifics that have to do with life in prison, um, specifically focusing on things like race, gender, age, um, gang affiliation, and special conditions um, for many of our inmates. So thank you guys for your time today. Um, I hope you enjoyed this, this discussion about jails. And I'm hope, I hope that you are enjoying these readings that are associated with these topics as well. And I will see you guys back here next week when we make our way into prison facilities. So I'll see you then. And I hope you guys all have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Thank you. I'll see you later. Bye.